All right, Mike. Thank you so much for taking the time. Really, really appreciate you taking the time. Rainbow is one of my favorite apps out there, especially crypto related. I think it's one of the best design apps in crypto and even even considering all different apps. So thanks man. I want <laughs> no problem. I want to start with your crypto journey. So you're part of Balance which eventually yeah. branched out where you created Rainbow. Can you talk a little bit more about why did you join Balance and why you did you start your journey in crypto? Yeah, absolutely. I guess um you know in 2018 uh I quit my job uh and wanted to join crypto full time. Basically, you know, it, you know, lots of people in crypto now might not remember, but in 2017, uh 2018 there was a bubble and uh you know, we saw like this big bull market and um you know, I was working at the time as a software engineer at this SaaS company and I was being a really bad employee because I was like, you know, like I was just looking at crypto all day long, uh, you know, and, and sort of getting quite distracted by crypto uh, instead of doing my job. Um, and, you know, I was, I was friends with uh, the CTO where I worked. Right. And, you know, I wasn't trying to, you know, I knew I was being a bad employee. Right. So basically I decided to, to quit the job and uh, you know, I really wanted to, to join crypto full time. Um, and I guess the thing that, you know, tipped me over the edge there was really the 2017, 2018 bubble, where it, it occurred to me that crypto uh, can never go away now. Like, there's just sort of no going back. Um, and up until that point, for whatever reason, in the back of my head, I had concerns about that. Like, I was, I was sort of concerned, maybe this crypto shit is, is not going to uh, be around forever. Um, so when I had that conviction, yeah, I guess I quit my job and I um, started looking for companies in crypto that cared as much about product and design as I did. And I landed on this company, Balance, uh, which was based in New York, which was convenient because I was also in New York. Um, and I ended up clicking uh, really well with Christian and Jin, who are my co-founders now at Rainbow, who at the time were all were at Balance. Um, so yeah, I guess that sort of was the, was the journey there, you know, eventually balance, um, you know, uh, ran out of money and there was sort of, um, some issues on the team. Uh, but eventually basically, you know, Christian Jin and myself, uh, spun rainbow out as a, as a new entity. Um, and because, uh, you know, the code base that we were working on, uh, at balance was GPL open source, uh, we were able to basically continue our work. Um, on on the code base that we were already working on uh, under under the name Rainbow. Awesome. So you worked a little bit and had an entrepreneurial journey where you started a company that that was related to three D printing. Yeah. What did you see different from from crypto uh, versus what you worked before in your first startup in three D printing? Yeah. Well, so you know. Uh, again, I think I said this before we were recording, but I think that you're probably the crypto Nardwar, uh, because very few people <laughs> actually dig up all of these old, uh, facts about me, but yeah, I guess, you know, when I was 19 or 20 ish, uh, I had started a company called Handprint, Um, and it was like, you know, at the time, this was right when 3d printers were really a new thing. And, you know, we were all young, like really young. We were like 19 and. Uh, in our minds, you know, oh, wow, 3D printers are going to get exponentially better every year, like year over year. And wow, like we're going to live in a future where, you know, everyone will have a 3D printer. Um, and, you know, so the, the thing we were building at the time was we were trying to build a web app that let kids uh, design 3D printable toys. Um, now. You know, we had these high, you know, these big ambitions, but the reality was 3D printers were not getting exponentially better. And uh, there was not this, this sort of path forward for 3D printers ending up in everyone's homes. Not um, yet. Not yet. Not yet. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think that there's, you know, I'm still, uh, yeah, maybe. maybe. 
Um, but I think that uh, what was different this time around, I guess, was, well, so first of all, like, we didn't really, I didn't set out to found Rainbow, right? Like, in reality, we founded Rainbow because balance as an entity died. Um, and we needed to figure out a way to keep going and because we really wanted to keep building this. Um, so I guess that that's a one core key difference, right? Was that, uh, you know, I sort of intentionally started that 3D printing company. And this time around, it was not exactly intentional. Um, but I think that, you know, as I, uh, I, you know, I, uh, as time went by, I think I, I gained a lot of experience and there's a couple of, a couple of core aspects of crypto that to me make it um, a much more viable uh, sort of like platform to build businesses on. I mean, fundamentally it's because it's programmable money. So figuring out monetization is um, something that's, I think quite uh, sort of like easy, but also you can, you can apply a lot of creativity to it. Um, but the big thing about crypto was its permissionlessness, right? So I am who I am today because I had, you know, raw unadulterated access to the internet as a kid and could basically learn everything and anything I wanted to. Um, and often that might involve uh, sort of doing things that might, you know, that might not be allowed, right? Like, for example, pirating software or things like this. And um, the free and permissionless uh, nature of the internet, yeah, like definitely made me who I am today and, and sort of uh, uh, like, you know, all of my knowledge and experience, I, I really do owe to the internet. And in the same way, crypto's permissionless nature, we view as being um, like, uh, essentially like a, like a, like an insurance or right? like it's, it's simply never going to go away and it's always going to continue to um, evolve because of that permissionless aspect. So I think that those, those, those things are what makes uh, crypto attractive, uh, attra attractive to me to, as far as starting a business. Interesting. And, and so you've started a company in the 3D space, eventually, you know, join um, a SaaS company eventually to, to join Balance. Did you move around to go join Balance or did you, I guess you were in Boston, did you move uh, to the Bay Area or to New York and then eventually uh, start working remote or how was that experience to move remote to remote? Yeah. Um, so no, I, I, at the time of joining Balance, I was already in New York. Um, I guess the, you know, uh, the, my first company, the 3D printing thing, that was primarily in Kansas City, actually. Yeah. Um, now, so after Kansas City, I ended up going to Boston, was in Boston for a number of years, and then ended up in New York, and I've been here ever since. Awesome. And so then you went to start, you know, Rainbow with, with your co-founders. And Rainbow, I mean, in my experience, is one of the best design apps in crypto and even, you know, uh, in like, if you look at wallets in general or like financial apps is one of the uh, best design apps. How did you achieve that? How do you uh, achieve such uh, good designs and, you know, with Rainbow? Yeah, well, I, I, I want to give all the credit to my co-founder, Christian, who is uh, like the best designer I've ever worked with by like a factor of 10. Um, he and I have a really great ability to almost like telepathically communicate about <laughs> product and design um, where, you know, Rainbow, uh, Rainbow as it is today is very much like uh, sort of a, as a product is very much a collaborative output uh, of Christian and I, um, you know, often I can just describe something um, and Christian knows exactly what I'm talking about. Um, I think that what makes Rainbow good uh, with design is is sort of knowing when and when not to simplify things. Um, and also, uh, I guess we're also heavy users of, 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 of Ethereum ourselves, right? So I think that being like very active um, and sort of using all of the products and protocols, et cetera, put us in a good position to actually design interfaces around those things. Um, and then, yeah, I don't know. I think that uh, we also try to make things fun and silly. 
uh, when we can, because it just, it, it makes interacting with products um, more delightful. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm a big sort of internal advocate for uh, making things like extra silly or dumb uh, just because it, it makes, you know, it just makes every little thing that you're shipping um, feel more special. Interesting. And how do you prioritize between, you know, releasing a feature that that's complete and a feature that has, you know, good design and 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 the the detail oriented uh, view of 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 yeah. that? I definitely think that that's something that we have kind of evolved our thinking on over the years. Uh, in the early days, we were way we were overly precious about things, and we would take really long time to ship things, um, you know, waiting until they're perfect and they have all of the little details ironed out. Over time, though, we've kind of shifted our thinking here to, I guess, fundamentally approaching features uh, from a more iterative perspective, where sort of from the beginning, the, the feature itself is almost like, ide like, even the ideation for it sort of is this incremental thing where it's sort of like, the idea is viable in a, like, there's a small idea that is viable, and then it can be improved in these, like, iterative ways. Um, and I think we also have, you know, taken more of the philosophy of, um, you know, if shipping something in an imperfect state, if we think it's going to, like, dramatically improve, you know, the experience for some set of users, um, we will you know, we will ship the thing. Um, so we definitely are less, less precious than we used to be. Um, and let me think, I guess, yeah, we're just far more pragmatic as far as like deciding when, where to draw the line um, and just release something. Does that answer your question? It does, it does, yes. Uh, so you're shifting a little bit more your focus into, you know, releasing more MVPs and improving the product over time. And I guess getting a little bit of feedback from customers, right? Yeah, absolutely. Because it's like in the past, you know, we've done things like, you know, spent a ton of time building something that then, you know, doesn't doesn't slap, you know, no one likes it uh, or it just it doesn't, get, <laughs> it doesn't get utilized, right? So it's important to put things to get things out there in front of users, gather their sort of, you know, their feedback input. Interesting. Do you have any examples of a feature that didn't slap? I don't know. I guess uh, there's aspects of like Rainbow's ENS integration that mm -hmm. I think we spent, like there are certain features that we built there that really aren't, that never really got super utilized, right? So for example, we allow people to customize and edit the metadata on their ENS name. So everything from like adding your Twitter handle and your GitHub handle and things like that. And, you know, very few users actually ended up uh, customizing their, their ENS names in that manner. Um, I don't know. I'm trying to, that, that's sort of the first thing that comes to mind. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, so you talked a little bit about, you know, the inter interrupta interruptability of crypto, meaning like and also the permissionless fact of it. So, in a similar way to the web, we now have we have permissionless money, but also permissionless computing. And Rainbow, um, I think part of it was built on top of Uniswap. Is that right? Um, in a way, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, so we were the first wallet to integrate Uniswap natively into the product. Um, mm -hmm. So. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's kind of a funny story. Like, you know, we integrated Uniswap V1 back in the day. Yeah. Uh, and by the time we perfected our integration, Uniswap V2 had come out and, like, was not backwards compatible. So we had to kind of, like, redo the integration all over again. Um, so um, in that sense, like, sort of, we were, you know, we, we were built on, you know, we built, we integrated Uniswap uh, historically. Um, let me think. In late 2022, though, we ended, we, we shipped... Uh, what we call Rainbow Router, which is, it's not really user-facing product uh -huh. name or anything, but it's basically our on-chain swap aggregator. So it, it um, you know, sources liquidity from all of the, the decentralized exchanges, not just Uniswap. Um, so I, I wouldn't characterize Rainbow today as being sort of foundationally built on top of Uniswap, but it definitely was historically uh, 
sort of we had a very like raw just direct uh, integration into into Uniswap. Interesting. And the reason for moving towards there is it to reduce costs for consumers, to reduce costs in general, increase lo liquidity, or why did you move from Uniswap? Uh, yeah. To, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, so um, one aspect of that was um, simply seeking a solution that was a bit more abstracted uh, because, uh, you know, manually or, you know, integrating Uniswap directly means that every time they change their SDK, right, we need to sort of update our integration. So fundamentally, like approaching it a from an aggregator perspective is, is sort of uh, just a better abstraction in and of itself. Um, beyond that, though, um, you know, I'm still love Uniswap. Uniswap's like one of the best things uh, in the industry, for sure. Um, but that said, uh, Uniswap isn't on every chain, right? Um, and there are many reasons why uh, liquidity for certain token pairs may build up on decentralized exchanges that are not Uniswap. Um, so in order to better, uh, you know, better serve our users um, and make sure that our users are always getting the best price quote, um, we integrate these, you know, we, we aggregate these, these DEXs, right? Um, so for example, like, um, you know, like we can do things like split an order across two decentralized exchanges, right? To get the user the best quote. Um, and historically, uh, for example, like, you know, stable coin to stable coin swaps used to, this is no longer really the case, but they used to like, you know, really uh, curve curve really used to dominate stable coin to stable coin swaps um and that was another sort of driving force behind um choosing to aggregate versus uh directly integrate uniswap interesting and do you see a, a a world where you move towards more of a centralized exchange there where you do the like you have the two sides of you know the the exchange you have enough volume where you can do transactions and then eventually yeah. um so um i guess short answer to that question is no i think that decentralized exchanges are just amazing right um and uh rainbow uh as a product as well as our user base um are very i guess what's the word i'm looking for like long tail assets are something that we think a lot about both at rainbow on the product side but also our user base is quite interested in long tail assets um long tail assets typically don't really work nearly as well in a centralized exchange model um long tail assets are, tend to be where dexes uh just dominate right um and i guess there are uh things in between what we're talking about here uh between decentralized exchanges like I don't want to say it's actually between it. Um, sorry for making this confusing. So, you know, there's centralized exchanges and decentralized exchanges. Um, you're asking if we would ever ship towards centralized. Mm -hmm. um, answer is still no. However, there are sort of additional things that we might do. Uh, to, like, for example, um, we would need to, um, we would, I'm not sure if we would be able to do this in America or not. Um, but one thing that we might be interested in doing, for example, is um, is um, matching user orders against our own inventory of assets. So, for example, um, instead of routing a user through uh, a Uniswap pool to make a trade, if Rainbow, the company, say they're trying to trade USD, say they're trying to buy ETH with USDC, right? Rainbow has a bunch of ETH on our balance sheet. Um, we could match that user order against our own inventory um, of ETH and essentially uh, offer the user both a better price quote, but also um, basically make the money that the liquidity provider would have been making right, yeah, exactly. uh, on that fee. So th those kinds of things are things that we're interested in, but frankly, not like a top priority for us. Um, yeah, that's, that's sort of like an optimization uh, that we can make. Uh, on the whole system, if, if there's sort of enough volume to warrant it. Interesting. And you mentioned that DEXs have a yeah. lot of volume, especially in the long tail. Um, and I've seen graphs showing that, you know, the number of tokens have been growing exponentially. 
uh, and also I think you mentioned of on Farcaster that um, a huge percentage of Moxie tokens or some tokens that were kind of Farcaster native were swapped on Rainbow. I think yes. all that. Um, what trends are you seeing in terms of tokens, and what do you think uh, is going to happen there? You know, five years down the road, if these trends continue. Yeah, um, I guess what trend am I seeing in tokens? Um, well, we're in this weird point in the market where it feels very uh, nostalgic for me because I feel like in the last bear market, we also had a similar cycle where I think that right now as an industry, we're at this weird point where like tokens like haven't done very well, like in the market, right? And I think that there's this like, you know, the market convinces itself that tokens are dumb and then that's actually like typically the bottom, right? And then all of a sudden there are these new interesting tokens that emerge <laughs> uh, afterwards and that changes everyone's mind again. And that definitely was a thing that happened uh, during like 2019, 2020. Um, I guess um, trends that I'm seeing, I'm seeing, you know, obviously meme coins are popular. I think that um, meme coins make sense to me. I actually think that pump.fun is quite good i've never you know uh, i don't actually i don't use it i'm busy but i think it's quite interesting the vision i have for like meme coins right i do think that like the example i always point to is do you remember when donald trump tweeted the word cafete <laughs> do you remember yes. that yeah, yeah okay like i always point yeah. to that as being the perfect example of like why meme coins can be fun or funny because like if donald trump tweeted the word kafefe today you you know there's a hundred percent certainty that the uh, kafefe meme coin would go from zero to like whatever a million dollar market <laughs> cap or whatever and i just think that it's entertaining and fun um and sort of short-lived and that most of the market participants are well aware of uh what it is and sort of uh you know the, the the potential shelf life that something like a Kofefe token might have. Um, besides that, though, I'm really excited about Farcaster. I think Farcaster is the most interesting thing to happen in a couple of years now. I, I sort of feel similarly about it as I, I did about like ENS and Uniswap back in the day, as far as being um, a, a fundamentally new um, sort of primitive. And uh, yeah, I'm seeing a lot. There's a lot of these cool trends happening on Farcaster, right? Like there's the DGen token, there's Moxie. Um, and I'm really interested in these tokens that um, are trying to build on top of that social graph. Um, so really excited by that. I guess, let me think of other trends. Um, I don't know if it's contrar contrarian or not, but I am a big fan of the DN. 404 token standard as well. I'm not sure if you're familiar with, or really it's actually just ERC 404, but there's a more specific spec called DN 404. Um, these are basically hybrid tokens that are both NFTs and ERC 20s at the same time. And they're weird, but they're fun and I like them. Um, so and, I don't know. I'm trying to think of other trends. And what kind of proper, like, yeah. How how does that compare to a traditional token? Yeah, so um, say uh, you make a, a 404 token, say there's 100 units total, um, if, uh, and you buy one unit, um, that one unit will show up in your wallet, both as an ERC-20 and an NFT, and the NFT you get is random, um, out of oh, the 100, 100 uh, items. And if you, so say you have one unit, right? If you sell 0.1 of your unit, your NFT goes away. So basically the, uh, the NFT sort of ex like, uh, the NFTs exist in your wallet when you own uh, more than one whole unit of the token. Um, it's kind of, it's kind of silly, like it, but it's also fun. Um, the benefit of it is uh, that these tokens are could be like liquid Very and liquid. tradable on yeah. decentralized exchanges. Um, yeah. So, so you could, for example, have CryptoPunks and then buy, you know, the 
the punk uh, token without having all the liquidity that you need. Yes. To buy now crypto it's punk. important. It, so that would so if they made it if if a new collection started today and used four oh fours, then you, that is true. But you can't. Um, or like, I yep. actually don't know if you can convert something that wasn't a 404 to a 404, but it would certainly involve a lot of like coordination and like migration. Um, so I'm primarily interested in the 404 standard um, as it relates to like new, like new NFT collections. Uh, you know what I mean? Less about yeah, yeah. the ways it could impact historical collections. Yeah, they just need to change the number, the 404. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. In internet terms, that, yeah. that's a bit confusing, but yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. that's actually a very interesting, um, very interesting. Uh, other yeah. trends, I guess, base is really uh, dominating right now. I feel like base is, um, you know, if not the, the top network in Rainbow, it, it, if it's not the top, it's the second. Basically, oh. base and mainnet are the two primary networks that people make swaps on in Rainbow. Interesting. Yeah, I I, I think at some point, I mean, we'll talk about the L2s and eventually maybe L3s. I, I don't even know if we will talk about the L3s, but um, maybe L2s will scale uh, enough. But at some point, I think people won't even, hopefully not even think about the chain that they are doing the transactions and it's all on chain as Jesse mentions. Um, yep. So, I mean, we talked a little bit about tokens and and the permissionless aspect of crypto. And I think usually when we think about crypto, we think about money. Uh, obviously there are new experiments like there's ENS, there's Farcast where you have like permissionless, for example, social networks, permissionless domains. Um, but there is, you know, Uniswap, for example, released a token called Uniswap token, and there are other protocols that release tokens. How do you see these tokens in terms of, of legitimacy and also the future of, for example, Uniswap token, ENS token? Um, yeah, that's the first question. Yeah, I guess, um, um, so... Yeah, I mean, listen, I, I think that uh, what really sucks is the American regulatory environment and the ways that it sort of in like it causes almost self-censorship to a degree The the yeah. ambiguity of the laws causes people to basically take actions, you know, it, it basically make assumptions uh, and sort of <laughs> uh, it, it just it, it really sucks. So I, I do think that a lot of tokens as they exist today are a little less than ideal um in those regards i think that what everyone actually wants is something closer to tokenized equity um or 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 just by default having an app like have these assets have cash flow um i do see a value in governance um in some ways and in other ways i i sort of think that uh there are some systems that are actually better without governance. Um, uh, I guess, what do I think about the, about the future of these tokens? I guess I do think that the future of them, um, you know, does depend to a degree on the U.S. regulatory environment. Um, you know, Uniswap, it looks like the DAO is, right, like moving forward with the fee switch. I haven't checked in on that. Is that still happening? Do you know? I think so. Yeah, I haven't I so. seen yeah. new news about it, but yeah, from yeah, yep, yeah. So I think that, that stuff like that is like really exciting and encouraging um, because I think that that gets, um, you know, that 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 makes the uni token um, much more valuable and something you know, and it really is what people wanted all along. Interesting and and. And so, I mean, Uniswap is one of the fastest growing exchanges in the globe. I yeah. mean, even compared to Coinbase, it's much faster. I think it, it already matches sometimes in the volume the volume that that Coinbase has. But I assume you operate in in different jurisdictions, right? And and the US is just part of crypto, even though you know the US might be a huge portion. Um I wonder if 
if the U.S. is still met, I mean, is it, still dominant in terms of regulation. Let's say the U.S. doesn't allow it, but other countries do. I wonder. How... I, I haven't seen. No, I get the point you're making, right? It's like, why even care about the U.S.? Why not just sort of do it um, in a way that sort of like meets the you know the global audience. Um, the problem there is actually rolling it out. Right. And I haven't seen any token distributions um, do that very well. And my impression is that, um, you know, a good percentage of uh, the users of a platform that like an airdrop might be going to, like, are in fact based in America. And I think it creates, it, it definitely is an unideal outcome to um, distribute a token to and sort of leave a very large demographic out of that distribution. Um, I think it like can, you know, impact uh, the perception of the project, right? And sort of uh, how people view it. Um, I think that it, yeah, I guess uh, it's definitely something that could happen. I'm curious if you can think of what maybe the best example of, of a rollout like that has been. Of a rollout of to a token, of, like a or? of a token to a global audience that's explicitly not America. I guess all of the ones lately have been with the with the geo blocking, but that doesn't seem. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, one one might say that the game theory might play out in such a way that even like the U.S. could block for a while, right? I I don't I don't think the U.S. is gonna block, uh, but you know the. The game theory plays out that you know if you're blocking, you're making your country less rich, and and so eventually you have to allow it. Else, you know, it's like uh, Airbnb or Uber, where you know, like <laughs> you can block it for a little bit, but like the 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 consumer um, basically yeah. demand. Like politicians care about consumer demands, and that's one one thing that I was thinking about. For example, uh, I. I understand the like how Ethereum has value, but I also think, for example, Bitcoin, how it has value and how, for example, corporations like MicroStrategy and countries adopt it. If they adopt it and they become, you know, richer, uh, others start noticing and then they start doing the same because it's a popularity uh, contest, right, at the end of the day. So uh, totally. if, that, if that makes you more popular... Um, and that's totally. why I think, I think, for example, crypto will be, no matter what, no matter you know, in the next administration, if they are, if they are attacking crypto, like you know, four years down the road, they will need to accept it. I just think it's it's like the internet, you know, like the internet yeah. also had some some problems back in the day, and even the gaming industry, but but it seems like it creates so much wealth for people that you know, it needs it will be I accepted. Think as a as an industry, we should be focusing on getting the children of politicians uh, <laughs> like, to become users of our applications. Okay. Um, you know, like, if you didn't finish that sentence, it would be, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, but like, you know, uh, I think the way to get politicians who are otherwise apathetic to care about something is to have, uh, you know, advocates for that thing sitting at the dinner table with them, you know, and complaining to them. And I think that, you know, that's, I would, you know, obviously the public, uh, you know, with regards to like Uber, um, obviously the public uh, rose up and, and demanded sort of Uber exist. But I think, you know, that politicians likely heard about it first, you know, through their kids. Um, and I think that, um, you know, there's a lot of things in crypto that, um, you know, the boomers sort of claim are illegal, um, but they shouldn't be like, for example, fractionalizing an NFT, right? So that's always um, pointed at as being something that um, sort of meets the textbook criteria for a security, um, right? Because if you were to buy a physical painting and to uh, issue shares against it, that is by definition a security, right? And However, in, in the world of crypto, where you could do something like fractionalize an NFT, uh, like in a way that's immutable, right? And there's sort of uh, no 
ability for the issuer to like mess with it at all, right? Uh, or to like change the rules afterwards. There's no reason that that needs to be treated the same way uh, as like selling shares against a physical piece of artwork. And I think that only when the sort of uh, only when there are use cases, uh, you know, proliferated out there where people are actually taking these actions, um, like fractionalizing NFT and like normalizing that, uh, will the regulatory perspective shift? Um, so I'm I'm here to accelerate. Yeah, uh, adoption of crypto by politicians' children. So yeah, that I mean that's why the, the heart of the question of Uniswap token is that it seems like a security, but you know in the crypto world, it like not nothing is just like the equivalent in the analog world because you have right. more properties, right? And you can have governance. Like, I mean, securities, you can have votes and things like that, but it's a little bit different, you know, and, and, and you can never, it's not the same, it's similar, but not right. the same, but it's interesting because at the same time, it looks like equity, but you know, it's not equity. Will it ever be considered equity? Um, that, I mean, that, I think that's the main question. Obviously Uniswap as a, as a protocol keeps growing. And if that keeps growing at, you know, at the rate that it has been growing, uh, the value should be, should accrue there. Um, so one, I mean, one related question to, you know, how you incentivize users and things like that, you have something called rainbow points, right? Yeah. And that's, that's completely different. That's like, this is basically a, I, I assume a program to incentivize people to use more uh, your product. Can you talk a little bit more about the inspiration of Rainbow Points and what, like, and explain the program and how it's doing? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, I mean, we launched Rainbow Points late last year. Uh, it's a rewards program and incentive program. Uh, users can earn points by uh, taking any on-chain action using Rainbow, right? So the more you use Rainbow, the more points you can get. Um, and we've done some cool things with uh, Rainbow Points. Uh, I guess the coolest thing so far is this program we call Rainbow ETH Rewards, where basically Rainbow um, distributes ETH every week um, to the top 1,000 points earners uh, of the last week. And that can change pretty dramatically, right? It's, it's typically not the same 1,000 people getting it each week um, because we also have uh, points promotions where we sort of have special cool things that people can do to earn extra points each week. Um, now, it's really just the beginning. We have uh, two more big phases here for um, Rainbow Points that are going to be coming soon. Um, yeah, the idea with Rainbow Points, though, fundamentally was to gamify the Rainbow product a bit more. Um, from the beginning of Rainbow, we've always considered, um, you know, like, we, we think of crypto almost as a game in and of itself. And we've always had ambitions to, to further gamify it. Um, and yeah, rainbow points is really just the kind of, kind of the beginning of that. Um, but yeah, it, it also serves as a, as a useful mechanism to, um, you know, try to build, uh, habits with users or try to get users to, to, you know, try new features or play with partner products, for example. Um, and we've seen it be quite effective there. Um, quite excited about phase two and three though. Um, those are going to be a little bit sort of different um yeah like uh they're it's going to be about um stickiness i guess is the only kind of like hint i'll give but like you know it's going to be about rewarding stickiness interesting and let's talk i mean talk a little bit more about rainbow one of the yeah. cool features about rainbow is you can see your nfts really well within the app and that's why i actually downloaded the first time the app i oh, was yeah. trying to remember and i I imagine, you know, for you all, there was a boom of downloads because of the NFT craze. Um, yes. Right now, I mean, if you look at the NFT market, even, you know, CryptoPunks, I was looking at the, the chart on OpenSea and it, like, it has, you know, kind of died, died down a little bit. Um, do, you, do you think there will be another NFT boom uh, what do you think it's going to drive NFT, 
NFTs in the future? Do you see, you know, different uh, applications of NFT? How do you see NFTs in the future and how that interacts with Rainbow? Yeah, um, I think NFTs like are 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 like going to be around forever. Like they're fundamentally one of the primary like types of tokens that can exist. Now, will there be another sort of bubble mania around a specific kind of NFT, right? Which really was like ten, you know, ten thousand uh, unit PFP collections, right? Um, I don't know. I don't know if that if that same uh, sort of phenomena will happen again. Um, but NFTs as a format are here to stay, and I think can be used in really interesting ways. Um, I think like you know. One of my favorite NFT projects lately is is Base Paint. I think Base Paint is really really cool. Um, I really like the sort of open collaborative nature of it, um, and I think that they're doing more interesting things than most other projects. Party DAO is quite interesting uh, with their sort of use of NFTs, really just to represent like membership cards into a party. I think that they did a great job with those nfts like themselves like they're, they're really cool they're like svg and they animate um but i also think that that uh some of the latest innovations that zora has released um those excite me a lot too so with zora's latest upgrade um uh once an nft finishes its minting period it automatically deploys a uniswap pool and uh creates a liquid market for those nfts and i think that um, you know, uh, like innovations like that are quite interesting and will, um, very likely be a part of any sort of new, like NFT future. Like if there was, was to be a, a new, like renewed bubble, I, I would imagine that it would leverage some of those things. We talked about, you know, how you started integrating with Uniswap, then you have your own router, um, but also integration with ENS. Um, displaying NFTs. Um, right now, one of the most interesting projects that you mentioned is Forecaster. Do you see any integrations uh, with Forecaster and any other permissionless projects that you're you're seeing? Definitely. So that's what we're cooking right now. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, um, uh, I guess this is also another example of Rainbow kind of coming a little bit more data driven. So you know, we've seen a huge success with Rainbow uh, amongst the Farcaster user base. And uh, we saw like a really disproportionate amount of the DGEN token volume uh, coming through Rainbow as well. Um, so that's given us, uh, you know, a greater mandate to continue to focus on Farcaster adjacent things. Um, Moxie is, is sort of this new thing happening over on Farcaster. Um, we've been integrating Moxie. Um, what we're about to ship next is a uh, into a mobile wallet protocol integration. Um, what that's going to enable is um, finally you'll be able to interact with transaction frames uh, in Warpcast and have them deep link and open to Rainbow instead of the current uh, flow, which only opens to Coinbase Wallet. Um, uh, so excited about that! I think that that is going to um, you know, people, I, I think that, frankly, there's a lot of Farcaster users who only use Rainbow and don't really use Coinbase Wallet. And I think that um, this integration is going to actually see uh, transaction frames become um, just more popular and more engaged with. Um, the real exciting stuff, though, that we're doing with Farcaster has less to do with, um, like, actually working with their team. It's more of like a, again, permissionless sort of feature here. What we're really interested in right now is um, uh, effectively um, adding degrees of social proofing everywhere in the app, right? So what I mean by that, the word social proof, I think is honestly kind of a web two phrase, um, but imagine uh, like, imagine you're connecting to a, a DAP for the first time. Um, mm -hmm. Rainbow wants to show a face of like someone who you know, uh, uh, like, sorry. So 
if anybody you know has ever connected to that DAP before, we're going to show you their face and be like, you have 25 friends who have connected to this DAP before, right? Um, and we think that, you know, in that example, um, showing uh, people who you know who have interacted with this DAP is very likely to lower your perception of the risk there. Um, and again, because I think, frankly, most of users in crypto, th their assessment of a given protocols like security or safetyness, right, or the risk associated with it is very driven by um, uh, social, like, so, like, you know, like, whether someone they trust sort of says good things about it, right? It's very uh, socially driven. Um, so we think that that can make a big impact um, and sort of de-risk a whole number of actions for users. The more exciting thing, though, is ways that we can leverage the Farcaster social graph to um, drive recommendations. Um, so the biggest fundamental like product problem uh, that every wallet faces uh, is the okay, what next problem. Okay, so basically you can convince a user to download the wallet. You can convince them to put a little bit of money in it, but then the user asks, what next? What do I do now, right? And answering that problem is really difficult because frankly, the things to recommend to the user, they change. Like the, the relevant dApps or sort of the like the actual activity that that people are taking it changes so regularly um <laughs> that it's really difficult to uh sort of suggest things to a user and um by integrating the farcaster social graph what we can do is actually surface to you uh recommendations based on the activity of the people you follow right and even if you don't have a social graph like say say a user is not a farcaster user we can um, look at the contents of their wallet and um, sort of um, like, what's the word for it? Like we can s sort of, s we can look at the shit in their wallet and find a Farcaster user out there who has similar types of shit in their wallet and basically give this user who's not a far. we can basically give them the same recommendations, yeah. right? Um, so that's what we're really excited about right now. And that's what we're working on is effectively this recommendation algorithm um, that's driven by Farcaster data. Um, it's going to be scoped first to being just tokens, uh, token recommendations. Um, but our ambition here is to uh, like create a multi-purpose recommendation algorithm that can surface things like NFT mints. It can surface things like dApps themselves, just dApps that are trending. Um, also things like you know, DeFi actions, right? Like if everybody is sort of depositing into something like to surface that as well. Um, yeah, so we're really excited about that. I think that that can be really cool and actually create um, an experience that really hasn't been done before in crypto, right? There really isn't a place to go look to see what's trending in this way um, because most of the places that exist, right, are quite noisy. Um, Dex Screener, right which is great everybody uses dex screener um but it's kind of noisy right and in fact half of the stuff it's going to show you like if it knew anything about you it could probably hide half of the stuff right because half of the stuff it, it should know that you're you're not going to be interested in right um so i think that uh yeah the the sort of open permissionless social graph for the first time is going to enable um really high signal uh, recommendations. Um, and that's something we're really excited about. Um, so, you know, the first iteration of that, that we're going to ship is primarily like, um, yeah, like, like sort of like, you know, a list of tokens that are weighted by, uh, sort of people, you know, who have interacted with them. Um, but over time, we also imagine, um, sort of doing things like directly integrating transaction frames into rainbow right so uh frames are an open standard and um you can display them however you would like right so in warpcast they show it as this yeah. like rectangle with like mm -hmm. kind of ugly buttons um but actually you can show them however you want um it's up <laughs> to the app right 
so we're gonna uh kind of integrate them more natively in rainbow um but that's kind of like step five right we got a bunch of steps ahead uh, ahead of that a hundred percent that's super interesting and that shows the power of ethereum and also how early it is also crypto in general yes. how you know it, like it's a social graph it's a decentralized computer it's it's a bunch of things all together and that that has like some really strong network effects that people I think most people don't realize uh, the power of these network effects. Um, yeah, I think that it's true. The network effects are real. Um, and yeah, actually that's sort of coming back to rainbow points. It's like, that's very much, we're trying to create uh, the next versions of, of like phase two and phase three of rainbow points here uh, is going to be about trying to create network effects around a wallet for the first time um because right now there's there's really um wallets sort of don't have network effects really um but yeah we're excited about uh trying to create network effects for the first time awesome we're almost out of time just one last question sure. what, this is a very open-ended question but what kind of things do you think will will see in crypto five to ten years down the road, what kind of things do you want to see five to 10 years down the road? Um, yeah. Yeah, really, really interesting question. I'd say, um, I think that, um, I think that crypto goes through cycles and um, it gets overly excited about some new primitive uh, and sort of runs with it in a way that is unnuanced, right? So I feel like NFTs, right? Like it had this big mania. DAOs had a big mania. Um, I think in five to 10 years, what I'm looking forward to is the ways that crypto and, and particularly sort of structures like DAOs can, um, can, can influence uh, what it means to be a small business owner in america so um when i look at things like um okay if you run a local coffee shop right and you wanted to uh like give equity in your coffee shop to your baristas right i don't think that your average coffee shop owner knows how to go do that right they're, they probably have to call an accountant, a lawyer, right? Like mo it's, it's this messy process. And um, the, the reason that that is a messy process is because uh, it's like this legacy system, right? It's, it, uh, it's not a purely digital system. Um, so I imagine in the future, things like Stripe Atlas, you know, uh, Stripe Atlas is sort yeah. of like a, like a dashboard where you can like create an LLC and sort of issue share all of these things. I, I can imagine products like Stripe Atlas existing for small businesses that have infinite sort of remix ability. Um, and I get really excited about that because I think that um, it's going to usher sort of a new renaissance in small business where I think that, um, you know, small businesses will be able to be far more nimble. And I think that people will be more attracted uh, towards uh, small business entrepreneurship when a lot of the sort of bullshit uh, gets removed from it or when they get ex excited or inspired by um, the new potentials, uh, potential sort of structures that things like DAOs can can actually, uh, you know, Enable. create. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, no, I, I think that that's, a, that's what I'm excited about most is sort of uh, ways that this can impact small business, um, sort of create new organizational structures in and of themselves. Um, but then also sort of that actually implicitly uh, assumes that um, a lot of the U.S. regulatory posture shifts, right? Like you really can't do what I just described today because of the archaic uh, regulatory perspective. Um, so I guess inherent in what I'm saying is also the idea that things like equity that you're getting from your, you know, if you're a barista at the store, you should be able to use that as collateral. You know what I mean? And sort of 100%. have that 
real world asset actually have um, value uh, in DeFi and things like that. So yeah. I guess that's and, kind of my exciting vision. And that's the interesting part that like the Uniswap, if you think that as an equity, I mean, you can also, I mean, that's all, all what rich people do. They, they take yes. a loan against, you know, their holdings. And yes. I mean, on chain, that's very easy. And that's one of the things why, I mean, ending a great note, I think why crypto, I think is going to be so big. And I don't think people understand how big it's going to be is because it's free markets to the extreme. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, you see crypto companies being so small and, and they grow really, really fast. And I mean, Uniswap is one example, right? Like they, they didn't have that many people inside and they grew really, really big. And that's... They have a lot of people now, but yeah, at the time yeah, it was like yeah, four or five. Yeah. 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 And like, that's exactly the opposite of AI. AI, you know, you have the central entities, big tech injecting a ton of money. And in order for you to survive, you need like tons and tons and tons and billions of money. So you need to be like adjacent to, you know, Microsoft or whatever. And crypto is the exact opposite. But I agree. anyway, yeah. Awesome. 